The Sierra Nevada Railroad was once called the deadliest stretch of track in America, a place where crewmen braved 140 degrees in the cab and air thick with lethal carbon monoxide. Dozens collapsed each year. Some never made it out alive. Southern Pacific's solution was radical. They turned the entire locomotive backward, putting the crew in front of the boiler. Experts called the move reckless and insane. But that so-called backward design would save lives, silence critics, and rewrite railroad history. What made a gamble this wild become a legend? And why did it vanish almost overnight? To answer that, you need to understand just how deadly the mountain truly was. Donna Pass slices through the Sierra Nevada like a scar, climbing from the pine forests near Blue Canyon to a summit over 7,000 feet above sea level. The railroad that conquered this mountain did not just fight snow and gravity, it fought the mountain's own anatomy. For nearly 40 miles, the tracks vanished under wooden snowsheds and through rock tunnels carved by hand. These sheds, built after avalanches buried the line again and again, formed a nearly unbroken, box-like corridor between Blue Canyon and Truckee. Inside, the world shrank to a black, creaking tube, barely wider than the trains themselves. On the steepest grades, the climb reached 2.2%, enough to slow a heavy freight to a crawl. The railroad's answer was brute force. Double or triple the locomotives, throttle wide open, every engine straining just to keep the steel moving uphill. But the real danger was not outside, it was the air itself. When a steam locomotive entered a tunnel or snowshed, its exhaust had nowhere to go. Instead of blowing harmlessly into the sky, smoke and superheated gases slammed into the low roof, rolled back, and pooled around the train. With each foot forward, the tunnel filled with more exhaust, carbon monoxide, sulfur, and steam, until the air behind the engine became a toxic cloud. The longer the shed or tunnel, the thicker and deadlier that cloud became. There was no escape. Some tunnels stretched more than a thousand feet, with only darkness and echoing engine noise for company. The longest, the original Summit Tunnel, ran 1,659 feet through solid granite. But the real killer was the combined effect. Over a dozen tunnels, strung together by nearly continuous snowsheds, created a suffocating gauntlet that could last for hours. In winter, snowdrifts blocked any hope of ventilation. In summer, the wooden sheds baked in the sun, turning the inside into an oven. Trains moved so slowly on the grades that the exhaust had time to build up. The mountain's geography trapped the poison, and the railroad's own defenses, those miles of sheds meant to save the line from snow, became a hazard that threatened every crew. Inside the cab, men fought for breath, eyes burning, lungs raw, sweat pouring down as the thermometer soared past 130 degrees. The mountain had turned the railroad into a sealed chamber, and every trip through the pass was a gamble with suffocation. No matter how many trains climbed the Sierra, the geography never changed. The railroad's greatest achievement, crossing the summit, was also its most dangerous flaw, a 40-mile stretch where the air itself could kill. Southern Pacific's management watched the crew crisis on Donna Pass spiral from bad to worse. With every new report of a fireman passing out or an engineer nearly losing control, the company scrambled for answers. Anything short of redesigning the locomotive itself. The first response came in the form of respirators. In 1905, records show the railroad ordering hundreds of cotton and felt masks, issuing them to every crew assigned to the mountain. The instructions were clear. Soak the mask in water, tie it over your nose and mouth, and hope it filtered out the worst of the fumes. But the results were miserable. The masks clogged with soot after just a few tunnels. Breathing through them became almost as hard as breathing the smoke itself. Crews complained of headaches, dizziness, and a sour taste that lingered long after they had left the sheds. In the worst cases, the masks made no difference at all. Men still collapsed, and the incident logs kept filling up. Next came the mechanical fixes. Southern Pacific's engineers experimented with deflectors mounted on the smokestack, metal hoods and angled plates meant to throw the exhaust higher up or to the side, away from the cab. The theory looked promising on paper. 
In practice, the smoke ignored the hardware. Inside a tunnel, the exhaust still slammed into the roof, spread out, and rolled right back into the cab. Deflectors sometimes made visibility worse, scattering soot onto the windows and blocking the crew's view of signals. One test in 1907 led to a near miss when the engineer could not see a stop signal through the haze and only braked in time by instinct. Safety circulars from this period reveal a growing sense of futility. Dispatchers were told to stagger train movements, leaving longer gaps between runs to let the tunnels clear. Crews were reminded to keep cab doors open for airflow, to watch for signs of heat exhaustion, to tie wet rags around their faces if all else failed. But none of these measures address the real problem, the design of the locomotive itself. The air inside the sheds kept getting hotter, the smoke thicker, and the list of hospitalizations longer. In 1906 alone, more than 20 crew members were treated for gas poisoning on the Donner Line. The company's own reports admitted that every fix had failed to make a meaningful difference. By 1908, the frustration was impossible to ignore. The men on the mountain were exhausted, angry, and desperate for something that actually worked. The old solutions, masks, deflectors, new operating rules, were just band-aids on a wound that would not heal. Management faced a choice – keep patching over the crisis or risk everything on a solution that broke every rule in the book. In the spring of 1908, the Southern Pacific boardroom felt more like a war zone than a place of business. The crisis on Donner Pass had become impossible to ignore. Reports of crewmen collapsing in the tunnels stacked up on William Hood's desk, each one a reminder that the company's greatest engineering feat was now its most dangerous liability. Hood, the railroad's chief engineer, was no stranger to risk. He had spent decades battling Sierra storms and avalanches, designing the very snowsheds that now trapped deadly fumes. But the proposal he brought to the table that year was on another level entirely. His solution sounded like heresy to most of the men in the room. Turn the locomotive around, put the cab at the very front with the boiler and smokestack trailing behind. The crew would finally be in clean air, leading the train into the darkness, instead of choking on exhaust. The logic was simple, but the optics were brutal. Union leaders and senior engineers nearly laughed him out of the building. Representatives from the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers called it a death trap. Without the boiler in front, they argued, every engineer and fireman would be exposed to any obstacle or crash, no buffer, no protection. Safety memos circulated, warning of lawsuits and liability if a single accident occurred. The design was derided as a freak show in trade journals. Railroad Gazette ran a cartoon of a train running away from itself, the crew bracing for impact. But Hood had allies among the men who actually ran the mountain. Crew petitions landed on his desk, signed by engineers who had lost friends in the tunnels. Some simply scrawled, we want to breathe. For them, the risk of a head-on collision was abstract compared to the certainty of suffocation. Hood pressed his case with raw numbers. Over 20 crewmen hospitalized for gas poisoning in a single year, and three deaths since 1905. The company's own safety logs painted a grim picture. Every failed fix, every near miss, every man who staggered out of a tunnel coughing blood. The debate dragged on for months. Internal memos from 1908 show the board split between tradition and survival. Julius Kruchnit, the safety chief, warned that the railroad would be gambling with lives and public trust. Hood countered with the reality on the ground. If nothing changed, the next headline would be a runaway train carrying a dead crew into a town below. By the end of the year, desperation won out. Southern Pacific sent a formal contract to Baldwin Locomotive Works in Philadelphia, ordering a batch of experimental articulated engines, cab in front, firebox in the rear, oil fired to allow the fuel to be piped from the trailing tender. It was a leap into the unknown. No other railroad in America had dared to run mainline engines this way. The decision set off waves of skepticism across the industry, but for the men on Donna Pass, it was a lifeline. The company had bet its reputation and the lives of its crews 
on a design that looked wrong from every angle. The real test would come when those first cab forward monsters rolled out of the Baldwin shops in 1910 and faced the mountain themselves. Baldwin's Philadelphia shops began work on the first cab forward engines in late 1909. The design challenge went far beyond simply flipping a locomotive around. To place the crew at the front, every critical system, fuel, water, and steam had to reach forward through 100 feet of steel and moving machinery. Coal was out of the question. There was no way to shovel it from a tender now trailing at the very back. Oil became the only answer. Southern Pacific's access to cheap California crude made it possible. In these engines, thick bunker sea oil sloshed in a pressurized tender and was forced forward by air pressure through two-inch pipes that snaked under the boiler, past the moving drivers, through flexible joints at the articulation, and finally into the firebox just behind the cab. Baldwin's engineers had to invent new ball and socket connectors that could flex with every curve and twist of the track, all while holding back a torrent of hot oil under pressure. Water and steam pipes faced the same challenge, stretching the length of the locomotive and bending with every motion. The heart of the machine was its articulated frame. The first true cab forwards were delivered as the MC2 class, numbered 4002 through 4016. They were compound mallets, two sets of eight driving wheels hinged in the middle, able to snake around the sharpest mountain curves. The front engine unit carried the cab and firebox, while the rear handled the tender and fuel. At over 100 feet long, these engines dwarfed anything previously seen in the Sierra. The cab itself was a revelation, enclosed, insulated, and perched at the very front of the train. For the first time, engineers could look straight down the line, through tunnels and snowsheds, without peering through a haze of smoke. On their first runs through the sheds and tunnels, Crews reported a sensation that was almost alien, cool, breathable air in the cab and a clear view ahead. The firemen, instead of choking on coal dust, now managed an array of oil valves and burners, adjusting the atomized spray to keep the fire roaring. Every run up the mountain was a test of the new design. Shop crews watched for leaks at the flexible joints, checked for pressure drops, and inspected the oil lines after every trip. The articulated frame flexed as intended, and the cab stayed clean. Reports from the Sierra came back with the same verdict. The cab forward was no longer just an oddity, it was a working solution. The mechanical breakthrough was real. For the first time, the mountain's deadliest hazard had a countermeasure built right into the steel. Cab forward locomotives didn't just survive the Sierra, they ruled it. Southern Pacific didn't stop at a handful of prototypes. Over the next three decades, they ordered 256 of these articulated giants, making the cab forward the standard face of mountain railroading in the West. Accident records from the Sacramento division showed a 40% drop in major incidents after the cab forwards took over the grades. Visibility inside the tunnels and snowsheds, once measured in feet, now stretched to nearly a mile ahead on clear days. Engineers reported they could finally spot signals and obstacles long before reaching them. For the first time in memory, crews ran the hill without tying wet rags over their faces. The worst cases of carbon monoxide poisoning vanished from the hospital logs. Instead of collapsing at the throttle, firemen managed their burners with the cab windows open, fresh mountain air blowing in. Freight capacity soared. A single cab forward could haul more than 100 loaded cars up the 2.2% grades, cutting the need for helper engines and slashing delays. The machine that critics called a death trap became the backbone of the railroad's most dangerous district. Crew petitions that once begged for relief now praised the new engines. The mountain that had nearly broken the railroad was finally under control, and it was the so-called backward design leading the way. By the early 1950s, Southern Pacific's mountain lines were changing faster than anyone expected. Diesel-electric locomotives, once a novelty, swept across the Sierra with a promise that steam could no longer match. Reliability, simplicity, and above all, economy. On paper, the difference was impossible to ignore. Diesel units cost about half as much to maintain per mile as the big cab forwards. 
There were no boilers to retube, no miles of oil lines to leak, no need for a round-the-clock army of machinists and boilermakers. For a railroad facing thin profit margins and relentless competition, the numbers made the decision for them. By 1955, the cab forwards that had once ruled Donna Pass were already rare sights. Diesels led almost every heavy freight up the grades, gliding through tunnels and snowsheds without filling them with smoke. The last regular cab forward assignments on the mountain ended around 1956. Within a few years, nearly all of these giants had been struck from the roster and cut up for scrap. The machine that had saved so many crews from suffocation was swept aside by a new kind of progress. Only one cab forward escaped the torch. AC-12 number 4294, built in 1944, was set aside for preservation as the last of its kind. After retirement, it was moved to Sacramento, where it stands today at the California State Railroad Museum. A silent witness to an era when survival on the mountain depended on a design the world once called backward. One preserved engine in Sacramento reminds us that real progress often runs against the grain. Today, life or death challenges still demand solutions that defy tradition and ego. The lesson endures. When experts resist change, it is the stakes that matter, not appearances. Innovation saves lives only when we are willing to look forward not just follow the rails. What would you turn around to make tomorrow safer?